A Patriot's History of the United States Chapter 2, Part 5 Benign Neglect Continued clashes between the colonial legislators and governors, picked by the Crown, only heralded a larger dissatisfaction among Americans with their position in the empire. Three factors fueled their growing discomfort with English rule. First, there was the tenuous nature of imperial holdings themselves. Overseas possessions required constant protection and defense against foreign threats, especially those posed by the French. Not only did Britain have to maintain a large, well-equipped navy capable of extending English power to all areas of the globe, but colonial settlements also needed troops to defend against natives and encroachment from other nations' colonies. A nation as small as England could not hope to protect its possessions with English soldiers alone. It needed conscripts or volunteers from the colonies themselves. Even so, the cost of supporting such far-flung operations, even in peacetime, was substantial. In wartime, the expense of maintaining armies overseas soared still further. Attempts to spread the expense to the colonists themselves without extending to them representation in England soon bred animosity in the North American colonies. A second factor already evident in Bacon's rebellion involved a growing difference between Americans and Englishmen caused by the separation of the English colonists from the motherland in both distance and time. In the case of America, absence did not make the heart grow fonder. Instead, the colonists started to see themselves differently, not as Americans to be sure, but as Virginians, Georgians, and so on. The final source of unrest originated in the flawed nature of mercantilism itself. Mercantilist doctrine demanded that the individual subordinate his economic activity to the interests of the state. Such an attitude may have been practicable in Rome or in Charlemagne's empire, but the ideas of the Enlightenment soon gave Americans the intellectual basis for insisting that individuals could pursue wealth for themselves and give the state only its fair share. It did not help the English that mercantilism was based on a conceptual framework that saw wealth as fixed and limited, meaning that for the government to get more wealth, individuals had to receive less the fruit of their own labor. After the Glorious Revolution, the English government failed to develop a cohesive or coherent policy for administrating the colonies. Even though by 1754, there were eight colonies under the authority of royal governors. The British utilized a series of laws collectively called the Navigation Acts, originated in 1651 as a restriction against trading with the Dutch, which placed regulations on goods manufactured or grown within the empire. Various acts provided subsidies for sugar, molasses, cotton, or other agricultural items, but only if they were grown in an approved colony. The British West Indies, for example, were to produce sugar, and any other colony attempting to grow sugar cane faced penalties or taxes. Britain hoped to foster interdependence among the colonies with such policies, forcing New England to get its sugar from the British West Indies, cotton from India, and so on. Above all, the Navigation Acts were intended to make all the colonies dependent upon England for manufactured goods and English currency and thus they prohibited or inhibited production of iron ore or the printing of money. As the governor of New York revealed in a letter to the Board of Trade, all governors are commanded to discourage all manufacturers and to give accurate accounts of manufacturing with a view to their suppression. Having the state pick winners and losers in the field of enterprise proved disastrous, and not merely because it antagonized the Americans. The Board of Trade, desperate to boost shipbuilding, paid subsidies for products such as pitch, tar, rosin, hemp, and other seafaring-related products to reduce Britain's reliance on Europe. As production in the colonies rose, prices for shipbuilding basics fell, encouraging fishing and shipping industries that none of the other colonies had. Not only did a government-controlled economy fail to keep the colonials pacified, 
it also unwittingly gave them the very means they eventually needed to wage an effective war against the mother country. Americans especially came to despise regulations that threatened the further development of America's thriving merchant trade in the port cities, Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Charleston. These urban centers had sprouted a sturdy population of aspiring merchants, self-employed artisans, and laborers, perhaps one in ten of whom were criminals, leading William Byrd II to instruct an English friend in 1751, Keep all your felons at home. In the country and on the frontier, farmers and planters exported surplus produce. Traders at the top favored the regulations because they allowed them to freeze out aspiring competitors. But producers and consumers disliked the laws, and they were swiftly becoming the majority. But even by clinging to the outmoded mercantilist structure, entrepreneurs in places like Philadelphia found that nothing could stem the advance of more energetic people with better products or ideas. In Philadelphia, opportunity, enterprise, and adversity reinforced each other. A young businessman could borrow money and move into trade, challenging the commercial position of older, more established merchants. His opportunity was their adversity. The rich got richer, but so too did the poor and a large middle class. All Americans except slaves were energized by the emergent global economy. In this new economy, raw materials from the American frontier, furs, fish, naval stores, tobacco, lumber, livestock, grain, moved to American port cities and then east and south across the Atlantic in sailing ships. In return, manufactured goods and slaves flowed to America over the same routes. Americans prospered from this booming economy, witnessing unprecedented growth to the extent that on the eve of the revolution, Colonists had per capita annual incomes of $720 in 1991 dollars, putting these people of 200 years ago on a par with the privately held wealth of citizens in modern-day Mexico or Turkey. The conflict lay in the fact that, in direct violation of British mercantile policy, Americans traded with both French and Spanish colonies. Large quantities of wine and salt came from Spain's Madeira Islands, and molasses, gold coin, and slaves came from the French Caribbean colonies of Guadalupe and Martinique. Great Britain was engaged in war against France and Spain throughout the 18th century, making this illicit trade quite literally treasonous. Yet that trade grew despite its illegality and renewed British efforts to put teeth in the navigation acts. Enforcement of British trade policies should have fallen to the Board of Trade, but in practice, two administrative bodies, the King's Privy Council and the Admiralty Courts, carried out actual administration of the laws. Admiralty Courts almost exclusively dealt with the most common violations, smuggling by sea. But like any crime statistics, the record of the courts reflects only those caught and prosecuted, and they failed to measure the effort put into enforcement itself. Smuggling made heroes out of otherwise obnoxious pirates, turning bloodthirsty cutthroats into private entrepreneurs. Moreover, the American colonies, in terms of their size, population, and economic contribution to the empire, represented a relatively minor part of it, meaning that prior to 1750, most acts were designed with the larger and more important possessions in mind. A critical yet little-noticed difference existed between America and the other colonies, however. Whereas in India, for example, British-born officials and troops constituted a tiny minority that dominated a huge native population, in America, British-born subjects or their descendants accounted for the vast majority of the non-slave, non-Indian population. Another factor working against a successful economic royal policy was the poor quality of royal officials and royal governors. Assignment in America was viewed as a less desirable post than, say, the British West Indies, Madras, India, or even Nova Scotia. These colonies were more British, with amenities and a lifestyle stemming from a stronger military presence and locations on major trade routes. 
colonial governorships offered havens for corrupt officials and royal cronies, such as New York Governor Lord Cornsbury, a cousin of Queen Anne, who was a dishonest transvestite who warranted the universal contempt of the people. Sir Danvers Osborne, the most mentally fragile of the colonial governors, hanged himself after one week in America. When governors and other officials of the empire, such as tax collectors and naval officers, administered the laws, they did so with considerable laxity, waiving or reducing duties in cases of friendship or outright bribery, which was widespread because of the low pay of the administrators. For the most part, the administrators approached the Navigation Acts with a policy of salutary or benign neglect, postponing any serious harms contained in the taxes until the laws were enforced in the future. This process of benign neglect may well have continued indefinitely had a critical event not forced a change in the enforcement of the laws, the last of the colonial wars, the French and Indian War. And we'll continue with the next section in the next video. Please click like, subscribe to our channel, and leave a comment down below. I'd love to hear from you. I love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.